Good morning, folks. We're going to get started. I know folks will still be joining, probably as I speak and introduce uh, today's webinar. My name is Jim Rodriguez, and I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Initiatives at the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's training on narrative enhancement and cognitive therapy uh, for youth and families. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone um, as uh, to today's webinar. Uh, note that as you come into the webinar, you've been placed on mute to avoid any background noise um, and any distractions. However, there will be portions of today's training where we will um, unmute you or allow you to unmute yourselves uh, to raise a hand and ask questions. So uh, we'll let you know when, when those times occur. Um, if you have any technical issues during the event today, please chat to our host. Uh, who will be able to uh, assist you with any technical difficulties uh, you may be having. Um, and then, as always, as we go through the webinar, please feel free to chat in questions or comments during the, uh, during the uh, training and during the webinar. Um, and we'll just keep accumulating those and putting those aside to bring them back to our speaker during uh, our open mic times. Um, and you can find the chat feature um, on the bottom of your screen. And then uh, what I'd like you all to do, though, is uh, today's training, uh, we'd like to collect some data on today's training and see if it meets your needs um, and how you respond to the material today. So what we'd like you all to do is to take two minutes to please complete a pre-survey um, for today's training. Uh, we're going to ask folks to complete a pre and a post, so please complete the pre-training. Um, our wonderful coordinator, uh, Connor, is putting uh, in the chat a link to a survey and we'd like you all to sort of take a moment uh, to complete it um, in these two minutes and then uh, we'll continue uh, with our uh, introduction and uh, training. Welcome and good morning to folks. Um, for folks who might be joining um, uh, and maybe hearing the silence, uh, if you can open up your chat and click on a link to a survey, we're asking folks uh, to complete a pre-survey uh, for today's uh, training. And we're gonna return to that survey at the end of today's training and get your feedback then as well. Thank you all for joining. Morning, good morning. Again, I see people joining. Uh, for those folks who are joining now, um, there's silence because we have a survey that's in the chat. So if you open up your chat, click on the survey, um, and if you can take a moment to complete that survey, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Good morning, good morning, folks. Again, for those of you who are joining, um, we're just silent for a moment because we're having folks complete a survey that's open in the chat box. So if you take a moment uh, to complete that survey, uh, we'd appreciate it. And with that said, I'm, I'm going to uh, begin and move on. So uh, very quickly, um, for those of you, again, who can complete that survey, we'd appreciate it. Uh, just a reminder to uh, the recording, the presentation slides and the materials uh, for today's training on narrative enhancement and cognitive therapy will be posted on our website at ctechny.org within uh, two to three business days. And then we do have CEs available for today's training. There's some information that you have there about the CEs for um, LMSWs, LCSWs, and licensed mental health uh, counselors. Uh, you must be present for at least 75% uh, of today's offerings. 
um, and you must attend using your own unique Zoom link. Um, and then you have to attend this offering on your computer um, so because your attendance can't be tracked on, unless you do. Um, and, and if you only use it on your phone, uh, we can't track your attendance. So please use your computer. And then CE C information will be available in about a week once we have um, everybody's registration information confirmed. Okay, with all that said, I'd like to introduce uh, today uh, today's uh, speaker and trainer. Uh, we're very excited to have with us today Dr. Phil Yanos. Uh, Dr. Yanos is a licensed clinical psychologist and professor in the psychology department at John Jay College. He is a nationally uh, recognized researcher on mental health stigma, and he's been doing his work internationally as well. He'll talk a little bit about that through his presentation. He's an associate editor of the journal Stigma and Health and the author of Written Off, Mental Health Stigma and the Loss of Human Potential. He's also the co-developer of Narrative Enhancement and Cognitive Therapy, a group-based treatment which addresses the effects of self-stigma among people with mental illness. Um, today, he's going to be talking, last week he did a training uh, that talked about the intervention as it was originally developed for adults with severe mental illness. Today, he's going to be talking about adaptations that have been made to it uh, for youth and families. So in addition to researching the causes and consequences of mental health stigma, he's also studied the effects of PTSD as well as psychosocial predictors of community participation among people with severe mental illness. Uh, he's an exceptional researcher and a scholar, and he comes to this work from a very personal space. So once again, thank you all for joining us, and I'll pass it along to Dr. Phil Yanos. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, just confirming that uh, everyone is able to hear me. Um, I'm going to just say a little bit about myself before I jump into the presentation. So um, I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, my main job is I work uh, as a researcher and a professor at John Jay College. Um, I also work on a, a sort of community treatment team for the agency services the underserved. Um, I grew up on the uh, grounds of uh, this uh, state hospital here in Wards Island, New York City, uh, where my father worked. Uh, at the time, there were some uh, residences for uh, staff to live in. So I was immersed in this world from a, a young age. Um, and I've been involved in supporting and advocating for the lived experience movement since the uh, mid to late 90s. And uh, currently I'm involved in uh, the organization City Voices and the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. So uh, that's a little bit about me. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into talking about what self-stigma is um, and uh, give a little bit of a background on it and then a background on the research supporting NECT generally. Uh, normally when I give uh, a longer presentation uh, or training, I, I talk more about community stigma, but we don't have time to uh, delve into that today. So we're really going to start with the understanding that community stigma exists and then try to understand what effect it has on people who've been diagnosed. Um, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, David Rohn, Paul Lysacker, uh, who uh, co-developed NECT with me, um, the National Institute of Mental Health, which, uh, the funding of which led to the development of NECT. And you'll see um, some students who work with me in the uh, role plays uh, that we'll um, watch to that illustrate how NECT works. Um, and they uh, were super helpful. It's Melissa Martinez, Dan Samos, Shirara Hussein, Kelly Courtney, uh, Francesca Belisario, and Amanda Sirara. So uh, stigma exists. The question is, are people who are receiving mental health services aware of it? Um, the research is overwhelmingly um, indicative that this is that people are and that they're very uh, sensitive to it. So research supports that 70 percent of people uh, who are diagnosed with mental illnesses anticipate discrimination. And other research uh, that uses something called the devaluation discrimination scale finds that 60 to 70 percent anticipate uh, rejection from others and believe that most people would reject a person with a mental illness as a friend, neighbor, coworker, et cetera. So what is the impact of this? Um, Pat Corrigan and Amy Watson um, predicted there would be three responses, uh, possible responses to uh, having a mental illness diagnosis and being aware of stigma. Uh, the first is indifference, where the person doesn't think that the stereotypes apply to them. They don't identify as a member of the group. The second would be righteous anger, where the person uh, knows that they're uh, a member of the group, but rejects the negative stereotypes and wants to stand up 
to them. And the third is what we'll call self-stigma, which we're going to focus on now. And in the case of self-stigma, uh, you have a person who identifies as a member of group. Yes, I have a mental illness or yes, I'm a member of this category. Uh, and they believe that stereotypes are legitimate. And as a result, they are directing them towards themselves. Uh, it is true that I uh, am a dangerous, incompetent, uh, unable to recover. These are the, ne the negative stereotypes that are pr most prominent. And when we think about self-stigma, we should be thinking about identity as well. And so what we're talking about here is uh, a situation where the identity of having a mental illness overtakes or supersedes the other identity categories that people have. So these could be identities based on their talents, identities based on their um, culture or um, social roles. Uh, so some people identify as uh, veterans based on their military experience, or they may have talents like musicians or social roles like parent or spouse or um, members of cultural groups. All of these things get overridden by this identity of having a mental illness when stigma is internalized. So uh, we have a good amount of research at this point on the proportion of people with mental illnesses who um, show what we could call clinically significant internalized stigma. Uh, most of the research uses a measure called the internalized stigma of mental illness scale. It's been translated into dozens of languages. And a recent review of 66 studies found that on average, about a third of people with um, serious mental illness had elevated self-stigma uh, with the highest prevalent among people diagnosed with schizophrenia. But we do see elevated uh, proportions among people with borderline personality disorder, PTSD, uh, less among people with um, depression, but also high proportions among people with bipolar disorder. So uh, we have fairly consistent evidence that a third of people with mental illnesses uh, show clinically significant self-stigma. And this supports that it's something that we should be thinking about addressing. Um, the other question is, does it have an, a substantial impact? Is it important? And this is where some of the work that my colleagues and I have uh, done comes in. So uh, we developed this illness identity model where we hypothesized that it would um, negatively affect hope and self-esteem, and that this would lead to a chain reaction that would uh, uh, negatively impact the recovery process. So it would lead to increased risk of suicide uh, when people have diminished hope and self-esteem. They would be uh, more um, disengaged from services and use more avoiding coping strategies, uh, such as maybe using substances or isolating. Uh, there would be decreased social interaction, and that this would have an indirect effect on their work outcomes. We can think of school as well for, for young people and severity of symptoms. So um, I don't have time to go into all the studies that we've done, but I'm just going to summarize some of the reviews that um, summarize what people have found. And so there were two meta-analyses that looked at the consequences of self-stigma. Uh, the first one was done in 10, 2010, and the second one was published in 2021. Um, and they both found that there are these very strong pooled relationships across all these research studies done internationally for self-esteem, hope, uh, depressive symptoms, um, subjective recovery, and also treatment adherence. So many of these relationships were supported. Um, we also did a review of studies that specifically tested components of our illness identity model. And we found, so we included 111 studies that were done since 2010 uh, that were done across 43 countries. And they included a range of people with different uh, mental health diagnoses, although mostly in the um, psychotic spectrum. And they were done across the globe. And what we found is that studies predominant, predominantly uh, supported the predictions that were made in our illness identity model, although um, some things were much more widely studied than others. So you can see that uh, symptom severity was studied almost every, by almost all studies, um, but very few studies looked at suicide risk or avoiding coping. Um, when we look at youth, um, there are some, there's some less um, uh, research that's looked at youth and specifically among youth with first episode psychosis, which is one of the groups that we've adapted um, 
net for. Um, and so I just want to mention some studies that have looked at the prevalence and correlates of cell stigma among first episode psychosis youth. And so uh, there's a study that was done in Indianapolis where we've been doing some of our research that found that a quarter um, showed evidence of elevated uh, cell stigma. Um, and then research done in India and Hong Kong that found that higher proportions showed evidence of elevated cell stigma. And in all cases, it was uh, associated with impaired social functioning. And these are just some quotes from our uh, current study that uh, we did uh, a qualitative study as a part of the process of adapting the intervention. And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But um, these are some quotes from youth about how they were thinking about stigma um, as they were being told that they um, had psychosis. Um, and so the, one of the youth said, I always thought that people with schizophrenia or some variant of it were just kind of crazy. They couldn't live like any sort of good lifestyle, like their psychotic sort of kind of engulfed their whole life. And I didn't want that to happen to me. And so this person was explaining why they were avoiding uh, services um, early on because of the implications of this diagnosis. The other, another person said, I was worried about being completely disconnected from everyone around me. Would I have to live in an institution for the rest of my life? Would I be able to be independent? So there were all these things that went through my head. So uh, the scope of the problem is that 70% uh, of people with mental illness anticipate discrimination. Um, roughly a third um, experience elevated self-stigma. And self-stigma is associated with a range of negative outcomes related to recovery that are independent of cultural context, age, or diagnosis. So all of this uh, justifies developing an intervention to address it. Um, and so this is where we uh, started uh, thinking about this in about 2006, 2007. And so uh, David Rowe and Paul Lysacker and I uh, got funding from the National Institute of Mental Health to uh, develop uh, this intervention. And our original vision was that it was going to be a long intervention, that it was going to be group based. And we brought in our um, our respective expertises to develop something that combined different elements. So we developed this 20 session manualized group intervention that included psychoeducation that was focused on replacing um, stigmatized views uh, with um, with uh, views that are based on uh, the research evidence. Um, cognitive restructuring taught as a skill to help people challenge negative beliefs about the self. And then narrative or storytelling exercises that are geared toward helping people improve their ability to integrate more empowering themes into the life story. And we'll talk about that more. Um, I want to note that Paul Lysacker, who was our uh, one of our co-developers, passed away this summer. Uh, it was a big loss to the field, uh, one of the most productive and influential people in um, the mental health field. Um, so we developed the uh, workbook. This is the original uh, workbook. Uh, not the version that you received for this training, because we adapted it and we don't have a fancy cover yet. Um, so I'm just going to share the research findings on NECT as it was originally developed for predominantly for middle-aged adults. And so at this point, there are five controlled studies that have been done. Uh, there was a small RCT conducted in the United States uh, when we had our experiment, exploratory intervention development grant. Then there was a quasi-experimental study done in Israel, uh, was, didn't use random assignment, um, and uh, that found uh, positive uh, findings compared to the control group for NEC. Uh, then there was a larger randomized control trial done in Gothenburg, Sweden, um, that found uh, that compared to treatment as usual, NEC had a better impact for uh, self-esteem and self-stigma. We did a larger RCT in the United States, where we compared uh, NEC to supportive group therapy. Um, and finally, there was a moderately sized randomized control trial conducted in Taiwan with the Mandarin translation of the manual. And this was actually done in a state hospital uh, among people who were anticipating discharge. So across these different studies, um, we found uh, consistent positive effects for self-stigma and self-esteem. And uh, because there are at least three, uh, there's at least two independent RCTs, we actually have three, uh, this means that NEC, it's, as it's originally developed, reaches the threshold of being considered an evidence-based practice. 
Um, just giving you a sense of places where NECT has been uh, tried or implemented. Um, there's fairly broad coverage of the globe, although um, Africa and South America are not represented. Um, and languages that it's been translated into so far um, include uh, languages as disparate as uh, Hebrew and Urdu. Recently, we started the NECT Global Initiative, and we have a website uh, that's at nectglobal.org, N-E-C-T uh, global.org. Um, so we've just started this as a hub for information. Uh, I've been able to post different translations of the manual there. Uh, recordings of trainings, including this one, will be posted there, um, and then links to articles about NECT. So this is kind of a place that you can come to as you're looking for information and you want to share things on different translations of the manual, et cetera. So we have a Spanish uh, translation that's there. So uh, essentially what we find is that it's it's effective. It has strong effect sizes, um, especially if we're um, com not comparing it to uh, an active control group. So our findings were a little less powerful when we compared it to supportive group therapy. Um, and it appears to be robust to translation and cultural context. So what about the uh, youth adaptation? That's what um, you are all uh, interested in now. Well, uh, we uh, became interested in adapting it for youth uh, because um, so many things were happening in the field, especially with the rise of early psychosis treatment. And so um, we, uh, for this current uh, study that we have, we uh, conducted qualitative interviews with 14 youth and nine family members to elicit feedback on the manual suggestions for adaptation. Independently, um, a colleague in Canada, uh, Lisa Hawk and colleagues also adapted uh, the manual for youth with bipolar disorder. Um, and they also have a version that's for, that's transdiagnostic. And they did this in collaboration with lived experience experts. Um, the uh, versions of the manual that Lisa and colleagues adapted are available on the NECT Global uh, website if you're interested in those, and they have writable PDFs of them. Uh, this is just the poster um, presentation that we recently did for our adaptation of the manual uh, for youth with first episode psychosis. And uh, sorry, I'm just, Okay, and this is for Lisa, the paper that was done for Lisa's adaptation for youth with bipolar spectrum disorders. So this was uh, just recently published in early intervention psychiatry. And I also want to note, um, this is a paper that uh, uh, Joe DeLuca and I did where we talked about um, different adaptations of uh, these approaches and other interventions. But we did do specifically talk about NEC for uh, youth um, with er with early uh, early psychosis, but also who are coming in with intersectional um, identities that might relate to self stigma. So, um, looking at the manual that you received, um, it conforms to the standard NECT approach, which is that we have two versions of the manual. There's a participant's workbook and a facilitator's guide. The idea around having these two versions was that it's kind of like um, the teacher's edition of a textbook where um, the facilitator's guide has the same number of pages, the pages match, but there are extra instructions in it that um, you can see as the facilitator that remind you of some of the things that you should be uh, pointing your attention to as you're working with people. At the same time, all of the participants in the group have their workbook and it, their workbook is theirs and they write in it and it's intended to be uh, something that they'll keep at the end. So one of the things that we did in our adaptation is shorten it. Um, in terms of the number of sessions. The number of pages isn't less, but the number of sessions is less. So we moved it from 20 sessions to 16. Uh, and this comes to a, that you're covering about three to four pages per meeting if you're uh, following the manual step by step. And it has five sections. Uh, there's introduction, which is supposed to cover the first two sessions, stigma education, which covers the next three sessions, 
cognitive restructuring, uh, which is the next five, uh, narrative enhancement, the next five, and then summing up is the last meeting. We also created the, a family manual or uh, caregiver manual that is really supposed to be parallel to the um, youth version. And so this is something that came across resoundingly in our qualitative work with youth and family members is that everybody thought it was a good idea for family members to be learning about this at the same time as their uh, youth uh, child or 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 uh, child or child that they're caring for uh, is learning about it. And so, uh, but we decided this was gonna be a brief version and it was just gonna focus on stigma education. Um, a lot of the same information is covered that's in the psychoeducation section of the youth manual, but uh, it, there's some additional uh, material about how stigma affects family members. The expectation is that this would be happening uh, in the evening over Zoom, um, and that it would be something that might be biweekly or monthly, um, but it might be spaced out. So if the youth are doing 16 sessions over four months, family members might be attending one uh, se session uh, per month uh, as their youth are going through the uh, weekly now. So one of the main messages I want to get across about NECT is that um, you look at the manual, it looks very straightforward, um, and it is. Um, and so there are educational passages in it that we're supposed to have people read aloud. Uh, there are exercises they're supposed to do. Um, but we don't want you to just do that. And I hope that'll come across loud and clear in the uh, role play clips, is that we want people to process it. Um, by reflecting on it, talking about it, how it relates to their personal experience, um, and that we use our group facilitation skills to do that and explore that with people. Um, we also want people to um, bring it into their daily lives, but we understand that um, that might not, uh, that's not something that we're, we're specifically assigning to, the, that, to them, we're encouraging it. So we don't have official homework like a lot of cognitive behavioral approaches do. Uh, we believe NECT impacts change by um, all of the different components of it. So psychoeducation counteracts stereotype endorsement by replacing uh, myths with facts. Cognitive restructuring helps people learn a skill for addressing negative thoughts about the self. And narrative enhancement is supposed to help people integrate um, these new ways of thinking into their definitions of themselves, but also uh, foster greater insight. And for some people, this can lead to uh, what we might think of as aha moments where there's um, a real profound change. And we have seen that at times, um, but it's not something that you can count on. The structure of groups is that they start with about five to 10 minutes of review of the previous meeting. This is based on the idea of them lasting roughly an hour. Um, and in that first five to 10 minutes, you would... Uh, address any absences, encourage people who are absent to review material, um, or and ask people who had been present to summarize, uh, follow up on any of the skills or insights that people might have used outside of the group, and then set the agenda for the current meeting. And so this is something that's important is to always set an agenda to be like, today we're going to do this. Um, in the middle, we kind of cover the core of the material. Uh, you spend 40 to 45 minutes working on those two to three pages, um, encourage people to volunteer to read little chunks of text, and you'll see that demonstrated. You ask group members for reactions, elaborations, uh, share their personal experience. You add explanation for things that anyone's confused about, um, and then you move on to another section. Uh, when, when we have written exercises, you encourage people to complete them, to write them in their workbook, then to read their responses. Ideally, these groups are run by a facilitator and a co-facilitator. And so sometimes we have a question about what do you do when someone has literacy issues? Well, we um, you can use the co-facilitator to help with that and help people who have literacy issues to complete written exercises. They could even dictate them to the co-facilitator if they're not feeling comfortable or able to write. 
And then at the end, the last five to 10 minutes, you summarize what's been learned. You encourage people to try things outside of the group um, and report back the next time. So one of the ideas is that we have two facilitators. And so the way this works is at best is that you have a system um, and that one person is primary and one person is secondary for each group. So what makes sense to me is to kind of take turns where people alternate. And the primary facilitator is kind of the person who's on point for taking attendance, having the workbooks, handing them out, um, maybe asking people to read if multiple people are volunteering. The secondary facilitator can be there to add thoughtful comments, to help people who are emotionally distressed, maybe talk to them outside the room if that's necessary, and maybe help people with um, literacy difficulties. So you alternate and everyone gets this experience. Some of the modifications we made from Standard Nect were that um, we reduced the number of sessions. As I mentioned, we added some links to video clips and I'll show you one uh, because this is something that really speaks to youth. Uh, we did add more examples relevant to young adult life experience and we added a caregiver family intervention that I also mentioned. We also added more discussion of anticipated stigma, uh, which has to do with not just directing negative stereotypes towards yourself, but concern about how other people will treat you if they were to find out about mental illness. We also have flexibility about doing groups on Zoom or in person. We have not yet um, started doing groups for our uh, study. Um, most people said they would prefer in person, but we'll see uh, what happens when it comes time to schedule the groups. But we, at least we have this flexibility. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about the items from our fidelity scale. Um, and I'll explain why fidelity is important. So fidelity is this concept that's come up in mental health um, interventions, which is this the level of congruence between theory and implementation. Um, and it's really this idea of like, are you doing what you're saying you're doing? Uh, does what you're is what you're doing consistent with the principles on which it was founded? And so one way to think about this is that there's a range of ways people can uh, do something and still be consistent with standards of fidelity. Uh, and so uh, David, um, who also used to do some of this presentation, he has this language about, you know, why does uh, a musical piece sound different when played by different musicians if the sheet music is the same? And so you can think about this with fidelity to an intervention, right? Uh, you get to put your own stamp on it, your own voice, comes through, but we're still um, you know, following a certain standards of consistency and it can still be uh, identified as, yeah, that is neck that you're doing. It's not something completely different. So we have these fidelity criteria, but they do allow for individuality. They allow for your own therapeutic voice to come through. So the fidelity items are uh, include structural issues that groups are generally are not going to be larger than eight clients. I know that some places run larger groups, but this is the idea um, that people will receive the requisite number of sessions. In this case, uh, 16 sessions for the YA version. Uh, they can be weekly or they can be twice a week. We don't specify how often. Uh, sessions are roughly one hour long and two facilitators usually present. Uh, that the uh, group leader uses the manual and proceeds in order. Uh, that every per participant has their own workbook, uh, that they read small sections and they write in the manual and you use open-ended questions to encourage participation, to encourage people to reflect on the material. Um, agenda setting is important. So you start out saying, this is what we're going to cover today. This is where we are in our larger journey. You know, this is how it connects to what we're doing um, across uh, the, the range of what we're going to cover in this intervention. Using teaching skills, encouraging, um, you know, uh, sometimes using self-disclosure if appropriate and if you're comfortable to illustrate how skill can be used. So cognitive restructuring, we can talk about everyday instances where we might uh, encounter negative thoughts and be able to um, respond to them using some of the cognitive restructuring skills that uh, you'll learn about. Reinforcing steps through praise. 
um, and using group facilitation skills to encourage uh, learning. So is there anyone else who can relate to this? And interpersonal skills. So it's really important that you're warm and empathic, that you use client's language and phrases, um, and that you believe that people can, get, can recover and you facilitate hope. And of course, managing time is important so that you can get through the material in the requisite number of sessions. Um, and so kind of the uh, primary facilitator is sort of the one who might be keeping their eye on time um, and might be kind of deciding when it's time to move on to something new. And one of the skills that we talk about here is tactful limit setting, which is sort of if somebody's maybe disorganized or, you know, going on tangents, you can uh, thank them for their contribution um, and then bring it back to um, the discussion. And we have our group um, norms that help with that as well. So the group norms and expectations include uh, norm three, which is that group members should be mindful when talking to make sure they give others time to share their views. Um, it's important that group leaders do not ignore, but validate the stress when it's experienced during the group, and that the group leader um, attempts to reduce stress during the session by showing empathy and helping the clients to use skills when appropriate. So essentially, um, this material can be intense. People do uh, experience intense emotions at times, and so to expect that, to validate it, to normalize it. And to explore self-stigma, so when we get into skills like cognitive restructuring, sometimes people will bring in examples that are everything but uh, stigma-related, and so encouraging them to explore stigma and self-stigma when possible. When you get to the narrative enhancement section, uh, we'll see how uh, feedback is a big part of it. So it's not just people writing and reading their stories, but there's getting feedback on their stories. And so we as the facilitator will model thoughtful feedback and questions uh, to encourage other people to ask those questions. And we also integrate ideas from the other sections of the manual, uh, psychoeducation and cognitive restructuring uh, to help people consider how they relate to aspects of their stories. And you'll see that demonstrated. So now we're going to dive into specific sections of the manual, uh, the orientation uh, and stigma education in the family sections uh, is where we're going to start. And I hope this will really bring to life um, a lot of the things that we do. And that's where we'll have opportunities for uh, questions to be asked. So um, the orientation section, um, which you should have uh, copies of the manual, uh, takes up nine pages. And uh, it's intended to be covered in the first two sessions. And so uh, orientation is important because it's really helping people think, you know, learn about what is this that we're doing? Is this something that's going to help me? Do I like the facilitators? Do I like the other people? And so uh, it's important that they that we cover the group norms and expectations um, and that this is uh, something that we cover every time people come into the group for the first time. So even if uh, if there, let's say there are four people who show up on week one and then two new people show up on week two, you would wanna make sure that uh, those folks see the group norms and expectations um, as soon as uh, they join and have the opportunity to ask questions about them. And we of course model our commitment to them by being on time and being prepared. Um, and so there's also something in the youth version, which is has been added as a icebreaker, which is the 20 statements test, which gives people to introduce uh, multiple uh, identities of themselves. And then we have uh, these core components of NECT, which is we start out with these exercises where we ask people to take a few minutes to describe themselves as they are at this point in their life. And in the um, youth version, they can also use, they can also draw pictures. And it's highly recommended that you cover the first one in group one, because I really think this is something that can draw people in. And uh, hopefully at least a couple people are gonna get a chance to read their responses. 
And then you want to definitely do the, the exercise two and exercise three um, in the second week. Um, and that that's going to really set up for this idea that they're going on a journey together. So after you do the introduction, you move into stigma education. And this is our first core component where we're really getting into addressing negative stereotypes, uh, helping people understand what self-stigma and anticipated stigma are, and talking a little bit about disclosure and some of the challenges related to it. And we do have more material in the youth version, so there's more to cover, but we do believe that we're able to cover it more quickly because uh, youth are um, closer to school and, and kind of that whole experience of going through uh, more material. Um, it's a very important to constantly stress that self-stigma uh, results from social stigma. It that is not uh, part of the illness or the person's fault. And this is something that we emphasize quite a bit. And we also, as I mentioned, added new information on anticipated stigma. And we've also added discussion on positive experiences from supportive persons in this section. So we've also added links to video clips. Um, and I want to note that um, uh, this is something that there is some evidence uh, can address self-stigma from a paper that was just accepted uh, yesterday. Um, and so we picked two clips that uh, provide two different sort of views on stigma in um, psychosis. Um, if you're doing a different version, uh, working with people with different diagnostic uh, categories, you might want to pick videos uh, that represent different uh, psychiatric disorders. This, we picked these because of uh, the focus on uh, people with early psychosis. So, um, uh, Connor, would you be able to share uh, the Drew video? Yep, sounds good. Yes. So we're just going to see a little bit of the Drew video, which we show. Well, while we wait for the video to, to queue up, just a reminder to folks that you have links in the chat to the material. So if you didn't already have them um, and you could follow along as uh, Phil describes the, uh, the intervention, just keep in mind that you have links to the materials in your chat. All right. Are you guys able to see just the black screen? Yes. Let's start it. Okay. mental illness isn't really something that we really talk about in the African community. My name is Drew, I'm 26, I'm a New Yorker, I'm a first generation West African and I'm a graduate of the On Track New York program. I think there are like preconceived notions about mental health. I don't know, what's a, what, what do you think when somebody has like schizophrenia? Never knew what I could do when I would let it loose. Never call the truth in the booth and to tell the truth. <laughs> well, Drew is my son, and he's the only man in the house. <laughs> There's 16 years between him and his older sister. What, like, what do you think our relationship has been like? You're the second mother. I feel like sometimes you try things out that you're like, okay, well, she's younger, she might be hip to it. Right. The Drew that we knew, right, became quieter in a high school, and both my mom and I thought that that was just growing up and changing. And Behavior started changing when Drew started telling me about how, you know, he'll be on the subway and people will be making comments about him. And so when he started telling me about him, like, you know, Drew, this is New York. People are busy. I mean, were there clues? Maybe. Did I see them? Definitely not. I didn't see anything. Mental health issues are not something that are within my scope of, of understanding or even thinking because I come from a country where if you have mental health problems, it's a choice. So I was studying media and film at BCC, Bronx Community College, and that's when I first started experiencing symptoms. It just became hard to go to school because like, I was hearing things on campus. And I was really frustrated because I thought everybody could hear what I was hearing. At that time, I was transferred to Nigeria. My mom worked for the UN, the United Nations. We decided that it was probably better for me not to be by myself. We decided to like move from New York and go to Nigeria. Because he's going to have a sense of self. You're going to grow up in a country where people don't talk about your color. 
they talk about Drew. And I guess he, he was right in the midst of it, and, but we didn't know any of it. We just thought it, it was a young guy trying to figure things out, but he was really struggling and wasn't able to, at that point, tell us what was going on. I think for the longest time, Drew fought on his own. Mental illness isn't really something that we really talk about in the African community. And at some point, it just got really bad that I had my first episode there. And it was like all hands on deck, like, we, we got to figure this out. So that's where we started. That's when I knew it. That's when I heard the word. How did I feel when Drew was diagnosed um, with schizophrenia? I felt heavy. I felt, whoa, it's, it's stunning. It's, um, what life is he going to have? So we'll pause it here. So we, we, you know, recommend that you use it um, uh, in, you know, in the group uh, and, and show it until roughly that point, especially as you're, uh, you know, talking about anticipated stigma, because uh, as you, as hopefully you were able to see it, stigma features prominently in terms of the expectations of his family members. And uh, he also uh, talks about, you know, how it wasn't something that he had a way of making sense of based on his cultural background. Um, and then the Celia video is also useful and it's a white female who's in college. Um, and so then in the psychoeducation section, we uh, go, we cover myths and facts. And we've added uh, a, an additional myth, uh, number five to this section, uh, because uh, relationships and romantic relationships are so important to youth. Um, and so we address each of these. And you'll see uh, the first one um, covered in the uh, in the role play clip. And as mentioned, we've added much more about anticipated stigma because people are so concerned with how they're going to be viewed by others, especially at this age range. A little bit about the family member manual. So this is called the uh, reducing self stigma about among family members of people with mental illness manual. Um, it's a new component. Uh, although there was a next family group that was previously done in Israel. And so we did consult with our colleagues there to kind of learn from their experience. And we ended up uh, taking what we had in the youth uh, stigma education section and revising it. Um, and we came up with 34 pages that we hope to cover in four sessions. And I know that's a lot of material. So there may be some uh, pages that we wouldn't cover in the group, but that we would encourage people to do outside of the group. And we have a number of larger number of myths, um, which include myths about family members. And you'll see one of those covered in the role play, play clip. And we also have a family stigma map to help people think about how other family members views impact them. Um, and many, many family members uh, shared how other family members have unhelpful attitudes in our interviews. So this is something that can allow them to reflect on that. We don't know really how this is going to go. It hasn't been done before, but um, it's something that seems to be uh, sought after. And that's why we hope that will enhance the effects on youth if they have uh, this going on in their environment. So now I want us to move to uh, watching these role play clips. And so the first clip is a demonstration from the uh, uh, youth manual. Um, but I want to note that the page number that it says in the clip is different than this. The one is in your manual. So your manual is, has it on page 18. But in the clip, it has a page number that relates to the adult manual. Um, but the facilitation strategies are the same, and the myth that we cover is the same. So, uh, Connor, why don't you go ahead and share that? So, um, we're on page 16 uh, at this point in the participant manual, if you uh, can find that. And, um, you know, you should have it in front of you, or you should have it on your computer if you're able to. Um, is everybody able to find that? Okay, let me know if there's anybody who has difficulty with that. And what I'd like us to do now is um, engage in the process of reading and discussing 
uh, as we do in every group. So is there somebody who would be interested in reading um, right under where it says following or a few myths or untrue ideas about mental illness, including schizophrenia, followed, uh, followed by the actual facts, if somebody would be willing to read myth number one and fact number one. Okay, I see Melissa has her hand up, so thank you for volunteering, Melissa, um, and I think uh, that would be fine. So uh, would you be willing to read that for everybody? Yes, so myth number one, people with mental illness tend to be violent. Fact, so research supports that the vast majority of people with mental illness are not violent. Most people who are violent do not have a mental illness and most people who have a mental illness are not violent. Having a mental illness does not necessarily increase the risk of violence, but rather experiencing specific symptoms such as paranoid thoughts or command auditory hallucinations, hearing voices that command to her others can. Like anyone in general, the risk of violence increases when people are actively abusing, abusing drugs or alcohol. Finally, it is important to note that people with mental illness are far more likely to be a victim of violence than to behave in a violent manner. Thank you so much, Melissa, for reading that. I know there was a lot of information there. So I want to pause now and see what people's reactions or thoughts are about what Melissa just read. I I, I don't know. I don't buy it. Uh, you know, I like I read the post, I read newspapers every day, and it's always, you know, a person with mental illness pushes someone on subway or something like that. And like that's headlines all the time. So I like I, I either like the I just like I, I don't buy it. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. And I know that um uh what we read in the paper is one source of information. Uh, that we might take to, you know, what is and isn't accurate. Um, can anybody think of uh, a reason why um, what is in the newspaper might not be consistent with what the facts were that we listed there? I just wanted to ask Dan if you've ever considered that maybe the things were not uh, you, the articles were not correct in stating that they had a mental illness. Um, sometimes we don't know if they're diagnosed with anything. We don't know what's going on. So have you ever considered that maybe that's what's going on in the papers and the articles? Yeah, but it's like usually crazy man pushes someone on train. Like they, they just throw that in there. And like, if it's not mental illness, why would they like use that word? I think that you just hit on a very important point, Dan, but that the media can sometimes use words that aren't necessarily the correct words to label someone with a mental illness. The word crazy doesn't really define what is a mental illness, so it leaves things up to ambiguity and can leave things up for interpretation, just like how you might interpret it as the person might be violent. Others could interpret it like Melissa, where we don't really know what is the mental illness. Was it really a mental illness or were they just labeling this person as crazy? So I think that just shows just how um, the media can be perceived very differently by different people. Other thoughts about this? You know, this is really important because this has a big impact on people, right? If they um, they believe that they're a member of a group that other people would be afraid of or should be afraid of. Yes, Sherry Art. So are people with mental illness violent? I still don't know. Okay, so let's go back to what we um, read in the um, section or what um, Melissa read. Uh, do you wanna um, uh, review that right now for us? Sure, I'll read that. Mm -hmm. You want me to read it out loud? Yeah, read the part, yeah, where it mentions that, yeah. Research supports that the vast majority of people with mental illness are not violent. Right. Okay. So I think what's what's hard to, to get straight, right, is that a person with a mental illness could be violent, right? Just like a person without a mental illness could be violent, right? Uh, thoughts about that question that Sherry R. asked or um, what Dan brought up? Um, I, I would like to say something, though I don't know if it's really relevant or not, but um, 
I think it's we also need to um, take into account who's um, like saying who's crazy or not the media. It's easy for the public to want to kind of demonize um, any of these like violent acts and stuff um, to kind of separate people who do have mental illness from um, those who don't because the public like um, they don't want uh, you know like individuals like who don't have mental illness to feel like they um there's a chance that they might act violent uh, they just wanted to say like oh that's because they're mentally ill like i would never be able to do something like that yeah that's really powerful stuff there kelly so uh i really want to thank you so much for for speaking because yeah you're bringing up that this gives people a sense of comfort in a sense that um I don't have that in me that's only for somebody who has this, you know, label or something like that. That's different for me, right? And also, um, just the word crazy is something that um, I think can impact a lot of people just because, like, my sister sometimes calls me crazy. And um, my sister, while she's not that nice to me anymore, she used to be like a friend to me, but um, she been she's been treating me differently since I was hospitalized, and she doesn't want me to meet her friends. She thinks that her friends might not like me, and that her friends might judge her for having me as a sister, but I don't think I really like her friends that much, um, actually. Her friends are a bit uh, different. Hold, hold on there, Amanda, because I, I heard you say some really important stuff, and I want to make sure that we don't lose that. Is that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what you were saying is that your sister sometimes um, uses that really mean word about you, right? But it seems like your sister's worried about what her friends think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and is that something that anybody can relate to? Yeah, I, I feel the same way. My siblings always call me crazy. And it hurts my feelings a lot, and they do it in a manner where they're just kind of joking about me. So I can definitely relate to that experience. Okay, so uh, that hopefully can give you some illustration of how uh, psychoeducation with clients can work. And I know a couple of people raised hands, uh, so I can quickly address questions, and then uh, we'll show the uh clip from the um, family of uh, family section role play. Yeah, so uh, Jim, do you want to call on people or? Yeah, Connor, do you, you, I think you can see, oh, we have Amanda Milano. Um, yeah, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. I couldn't before. That's why. Yeah, I turned on the setting just now. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to, I think a lot of kind of the challenges with the media is our own perception and kind of our own internalization of things. And I think I'm just mindful when I'm listening to the media or the news or anything on like, we all have our own biases. We all, whether or not we, we are really aware of them. And I think that that comes across in the media. And sometimes even when we're listening to it, we have our own judgments and biases in the back of our mind. I understand that media, I, personally, I don't watch the media a lot, but these things do influence us. And I think even the language about mental health, we're just recently really getting very comfortable with it. So I think a lot of that language still instills fear and that that's I think a lot of these inconsistencies and these kind of challenges with listening to the media and where we go with it so that was really all I wanted to say right and, and I think I think what that uh shows is that uh you know those kinds of things be brought into these discussions and they're going to be very relevant to people's uh uh reality um and mm -hmm. uh uh, that's why you saw we spent a good time talking just about that one single chunk of text as uh, Dan was immediately uh, sort of saying, well, I can't disagree with what I hear in the news. Um, and then other people were saying, yeah, but have you thought about uh, mm -hmm. the other biases that you bring to the table?
Yeah. Um, was was there one other question, uh, Jim? I, I th well, first off, I just want to mention, of course, a lot of comments um, in the chat box are all uh, around the media and its right. influence. Right. Um, I wanted to check to see. I can't see if there's another hand up. I'm sorry. Connor, yeah. can you see another hand up? Um, it doesn't look like it, but I know someone else did have their hand up earlier. So feel free to unmute yourself and chime in if anyone else had a question or comment. And, and the other we'll thing. We'll have time at the end. Okay. Yeah. And I did want to mention, Phil, and I know this is this is a big part of what you said that you don't talk about as much in this training because of time. Mm -hmm. and of course, the 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 immense impact of public mental health yeah. stigma yeah. And, and its role in all of this, not just the media, but all the other ways in which. Yeah. And I have there's some uh, presentations I've done on that that you can probably uh, find recorded, I think, on the Center for Practice Innovation, uh, Innovation's uh, website, I believe. Um, okay, so let's show the family clip, um, and then maybe we'll we'll address another question after that. Okay, sounds good. And I want to say, Rachel, Rachel we can... yeah, Rachel, I saw your hand up. Maybe after the family clip, we'll come, we'll bring you back in. Right. So okay. this, you'll see the same uh, folks role playing here, but they are um, role playing family members, and we're gonna, we're covering one of the family uh, negative stereotypes. Okay, so where we left off, um, we're on page 19, um, and we were discussing myths about people coping with mental illness, but now we're going to talk about myths about family members coping with mental illness, or uh, family members of people coping with mental illness. So would somebody be willing to read myth seven and the fact for us? Um, I can read that. Thank you. So myth number seven, parents are responsible for their child's mental illness. Fact, mental illness is the product of many factors, including complex biological, psychological, and social factors. Biological and genetic models have been shown to contribute to mental illness. However, there is no substantial evidence to suggest parents directly cause or lead to mental illness. Okay, thank you. All right, so what are um, everybody's, what's some reactions to this? I, I know it's the fact, but I, I disagree. Like, I know my mother definitely contributed to my own mental illness, and I'm sure that, like, the same was passed down to my son. Like, I'm, I'm like, it did, I, I personally blame her, and, like, even if it is just biological and genetic, like, I'm still the one contributing those genes. So, like, it still kind of falls on me. Mm -hmm. That's a heavy thing to feel, Dan. Um, and, um, again, but we have no control over that, right? About what our genes are. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to pin down what a specific cause is to something. So we're just presenting information in general, and we're not saying what's true to any one specific story. But we do want people to know that very, um, you know, it, it's not something that's supported by research evidence that parents cause their child's mental illness. All right. Any what? Anybody else or anybody's reactions to? I would. I would like oh, to say Melissa, something. I see your hand. Dan, I just wanted to say because my daughter is currently going through an episode herself, and I've tried absolutely everything I can in my power to help her treat her and do everything that's necessary for her. And I can honestly say that us parents, we're really trying. We may not know everything, but we do try. And my daughter, she's getting better, especially with, you know, taking her to treatment and doing everything possible for her. And we're, we're trying to be supportive to her as much as we can. Yeah, and I think support is a key thing. So I'm glad that you're bringing that up, Melissa. And I think, Dan, I'm sure that you're doing the same thing. You're giving the same support to your son, no matter what the causes may be. Sh Sherry R. Yeah, I agree with um, Melissa. Like we are really trying. Um, but Dan, I also want to say I've had also those feelings where I felt like I have caused mental illness in my children. I have two sons, both have uh, schizophrenia. 
one just got diagnosed a few months ago um and i love my kids to death and i would never ever cause them harm and i wish i could do anything to prevent it but unfortunately like dr yana said it's not in our control yeah and i i'm hearing people talk about having this feeling of responsibility and feeling it is different than being it right and um you know i want to you know i think it's important to see daniel that your feeling has been validated by other people in the group but we're still saying um it's um it's really unlikely to be true you know given all the different things that go into causing something uh like a, a you know serious mental illness so um it's you know it, it can it can help us to think that we know the specific explanation but um that can also lead us to into this kind of what ifs like if i'd done something differently or whatever and it's usually not any specific thing like that that we can pin down because there's so many things that go into causing these complex conditions so uh let's pause the clip now um because i know there's some folks who are uh eager to ask questions um so i'm guessing that the clip elicited some reactions from folks. So I know Euphemia, you had your uh, hand up. So why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Hi, and then I also wanted you. to mention Rachel and um, and Amanda have their hands up. Okay. Well. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Euphemia. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm Euphemia Strawn. And, you know, I think you did a fantastic job mm -hmm. on this presentation. And when I'm looking, listening to the video, Sometimes we have to be careful of overgeneralizing because interactions with parents and caregivers is an individual thing. So there may be parents who are abusive to their children, which can prevent illness. Um, right, right. And I, th I think what we're showing is that those are the types of perspectives that can come in in a group discussion. And even though the materials are saying family members are not responsible, uh, some people might say, but I do feel responsible, right? right. And using our group facilitation skills, we want to uh, allow the group discussion to uh, process those feelings, which yeah. can have a very strong impact on someone. Yeah. Thank you. Ra Rachel, I know you had a hand up earlier if you wanted to, if you still had a question or yeah, I was just wondering if um, the the program addresses um, like the role that religious um, beliefs can play in the stigma um, as far as like, well, I'll just give a really quick personal example that happened this week. I never forget to take my med my medication and I forgot and I knew I was going to have headaches at work and um you know, I called my mom and she's like, well, just pray about it. And you got to get through your work day. And I was like, no, like, I'm going to go to work and tell them I need to go back home. Like, and then, so I think even when people are addressing the self stigma, which I definitely suffer from, um, I just, I don't know how to react or help my family members understand. I'm just wondering if that's part of the curriculum as far as like the person who's suffering with self stigma, how to help their family members like get it? Yeah, so um, that isn't something that is specifically covered in the uh, content, but it's definitely something that we've heard uh, discussed before, and it definitely came up in our uh, qualitative uh, interviews that we were doing in uh, Indiana as we were um, coming up with the. Uh, material to modify it. Um, and there were a number of participants who spoke about experiences very similar to what you just described, where they were being encouraged to pray. Um, and uh, that's the type of thing that the group facilitator can address as it comes up uh, in the specific group that they're working with. And I think that's one of the great things about this intervention is that it's flexible. And that's why we can see it working in places as disparate as uh, Israel, uh, Sweden, and uh, Taiwan. So um, it it does have that flexibility to bring that in and to cover that. 
Okay, so um, I, I'm glad to see that people are uh, responding to these clips, um, which again, these are role plays, but they're not scripted. We were just kind of letting it flow uh, naturally um, as, as, and it does look a lot like a group would. So um, the next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna move back to the slides to talk about the psychoeducate, the cognitive restructuring section of the manual. And again, there's no cognitive restructuring section for the uh, family members. Uh, we're just doing psychoeducation with them. Um, but the cognitive restructuring uh, section is one of the core components for youth that we're hoping to uh, instill change with them. So there's 18 pages of the manual that are devoted to this, and they're intended to be covered in five weeks, which comes to three to four pages per session. And cognitive restructuring is intended to counteract negative thoughts that people have that are related to self-stigma that impact uh, hopefulness and self-esteem, which are two of the major uh, outcomes that we see of self-stigma across these many, many studies that have been done. Uh, um, Phil, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we can't see your screen in case you were planning to share. Ah, right okay. That's a good, good point. All right. So let me make sure to share it. And that will, um, okay, and so I'll go back in the slideshow mode. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, this is really one of the uh, major things that we think what we need to work on with people um, in terms of the moment by moment way that uh, stealth stigma impacts people's uh, thoughts about themselves. And so we basically have four stages in this process, um, teaching the connection between thoughts and feelings, uh, teaching the connection between thoughts, feelings, and behavior, uh, then teaching how stigma and self-stigma impacts thoughts, feelings, and behavior, and teaching strategies for thinking differently when confronting negative thoughts. So this is the, the skill. And um, it does involve a lot of hands-on exercises, and it's important people to do them, but also to discuss their responses as much as is possible. And there are three different skills that we teach um, and then we're really giving people options here. We teach them all, but we're saying, you know, see which one works better for you. And the first one is be a scientist, which is really kind of traditional cognitive restructuring where you're looking at the evidence. There's take your own advice, which is thinking about what you would say to a friend or what a friend would say to you. So having a different perspective on the situation um, and no judgment zone, which focuses on the nature of the words, if they're judgmental in nature, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, things like lazy, uh, stupid, things like that. So sometimes people with thoughts will have those words in them. And so identifying that, okay, there's something biased, something needs to be changed. We also teach people self-talk statements that they can memorize and, and, and kind of have as a mantra. Um, and this is something that can help people who might be more concrete and having a harder time doing some of these other strategies. But it can also be really an, a, a really helpful, um, you know, backup. We do teach cognitive restructuring in general terms, but there are a number of exercises that attempt to bring it back to self-stigma. And so we encourage the group facilitators to uh, focus on thoughts related to diminished hope, self-esteem, and concerns about how others judge them as much as possible so that we can really impact the kinds of outcomes we want to change. Um, we don't have homework uh, officially, but we encourage home application. And so there's some specific uh, sheets that we would, if you're meeting in person, we would encourage you to photocopy, or if you're meeting uh, online, um, making a PDF of that and emailing it to people and saying, try this, uh, do this when you're dealing with uh, a stressful situation and, and try to use the skill on your own. So let's look at the role page play demonstration clip where we're going through an example of um, Steve. Uh, and again, the uh, page is different than what you'll see in the clip uh, because this is the youth manual that uh, we're following, which is has it on page 29. Um, and make note of how we try to use facilitation strategies to guide people through looking at this uh, example of same situation, different thought. So go ahead and share that. So what I want us to do today is to learn about and practice um, breaking down how 
different thoughts in the same situation can lead to different feelings. So what we are on is page 27 in your participant workbook, where it says at the top, it says same situation, different thought examples. Is everybody able to find that? Is anybody who needs help with that? Okay. So, uh, and this is going to be helpful because this is going to show us how um, different thoughts lead to different feelings, and it's going to open us up to seeing how we could maybe think differently in certain situations that are upsetting to us. Um, and all of this is affected by stigma and self-stigma, which we've already learned about. So, is there somebody who'd like to volunteer to read um, the first uh, thing that? Uh, right underneath where it says same situation, different example, thought examples, up to where it has the question um, about how you think Steve would feel in the situation. Is there someone who would like to read that? Okay, I see Melissa's volunteered, and thank you, Melissa. You can go ahead. Okay, so it says, let's look at two examples of how the same situation can bring about different thoughts and feelings. Steve wanted to talk to someone and called a friend on the phone. His friend said that she didn't have time to talk to him. She said that she was too busy today. Steve hung up the phone and thought, she doesn't like me, nobody likes me. Okay, thank you so much, Melissa. So what I'd like everyone to do now is to take a minute and try to respond to what is written down there below. It says, how do you think Steve would feel in this situation? And we've already learned about feelings. We've learned about feelings like sadness, fear, anger, guilt, things like that, right? So can everybody try to write down um, on your screen or on your on a piece of paper, how do you think Steve would feel in this situation? Okay, I think everyone is done writing. Okay, so if somebody would like to share what they wrote for that? Thank you for raising your hand, Melissa, and I appreciate your um, willingness to participate. I want to see if someone else could jump in since um, you just read. Is that okay? That's okay. Thanks. Okay, Amanda, thank you. I think Steve would feel sad in this situation. I feel like I can relate to him sometimes because I sometimes I feel like calling my mom and talking to her and I call her and she just says that she's too busy to talk to me mm -hmm. and so she just has to hang up and then I have to hang up but I feel right. like hold, hold on there Amanda because I think you're you 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 told us what you wrote right which is that you think Steve would feel sad yeah. yes and it sounds like something that you can relate to as well mm -hmm. that there's times that people have hung up on you okay thank you so much and are there other people who wrote something similar to Amanda I see Dan is nodding. Kelly is nodding. Um, and is there anybody who wrote something different, a different emotion? I wrote that he would feel lonely. Lonely. Okay. And that's related to being sad, certainly, right? Okay. Sherry Yard, did you want to say something? I wrote that Steve would feel angry. Mm hmm And that makes sense, too. Um, and why do you think he would feel angry? Because I think she should talk to him. He needs help. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're angry, you know, in a sense, like at this person who is being kind of unhelpful to Steve. Okay. Um, all right. And so then um, let's follow that and, and write down our answers to the next one, which is how do you think Steve would act in this situation? related to his thought that we already learned, which is, um, she doesn't like me, nobody likes me. Okay, is everybody finished? Okay, so is there somebody who'd like to volunteer what they wrote there for, how do you think Steve would act in this situation? Okay, I see Dan raised his hand and Melissa. Let's give Dan a chance first, Melissa. That's okay. And I'll, I'll ask you next. Go ahead, Dan. 
yeah, if I was Steve, like, and then, oh, like, how Steve would act is, like, I would ask why. Like, why can't she talk to, to her friend? Like, if it's her friend, she should at least tell him, like, why? Like, I'm busy, I have work or something, but I don't know. I just, I don't like the vagueness of it. Okay. So I would, I would, I would say that Steve should just, like, ask why. Instead of, um, well, the person's already um, told them friend. they don't have time, right? So you're saying Steve, Steve should um, sort of kind of step and say, why? Why don't you have time? Is that what you're saying? I mean, just be common courtesy to mm -hmm. tell somebody why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Give more explanations. Um, thank you. Uh, Melissa, how about you? Yeah, I think that Steve would isolate and then want to stop bothering everybody and just kind of be by himself because he already feels sad and lonely and feels like every, he's a burden to everybody. So you're seeing Steve isolating after this. Okay, so would somebody be interested in reading the next one where it says, here's a different version? And I'd like to encourage someone who hasn't read recently to read. Kelly, I know um, I know you read really well. Would you be real willing to read? Uh, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Steve wanted to talk to someone and called a friend on the phone. His friend said that she didn't have time to talk to him. She said that she was too busy today. Steve hung up the phone and thought she usually has time to talk, so she probably really is busy, or maybe she's having a bad day. I shouldn't take it personally and can call someone else. Okay, thank you so much. So as you probably noticed, the language was exactly the same, right, up until it got to the point about what Steve thought, right? And so that's the point here is it's the same situation. So, um, would people be able to write down how do you think Steve would feel in the situation? Again, keeping in mind that he just thought uh, she usually has time to talk, so she probably really is busy, or maybe she's having a bad day. Okay, I see Melissa and Kelly seem to be done. And Sherry R is looking up as well. Is everybody finished writing? Okay, so would someone like to read what they wrote for this? Go ahead, Melissa. So I wrote that I think Steve would feel more neutral rather than bad or sad because he actually believes that there's a reason outside of himself that she couldn't talk to him. So I think his feelings would be just more neutral or kind of like what he was feeling before. Okay. Thanks. So what do other people think? Is anybody has a different um, prediction about how Steve would feel? So neutral. Did anybody put something similar? Okay, I see Kelly and Amanda nodding. Um, Amanda, what did you put? Yeah, I thought that um, Steve would feel better than in the last situation because instead of feeling sad or um, bad about himself, he might feel like maybe it's not a problem with me. Maybe this person doesn't think so badly of me and I have another option to call somebody else and I right. could see right. why. Yeah, that would make him feel good. Yeah. Yep. And you could call someone else. Um, so maybe there's another person you have on your list, right? To call. Mm -hmm. We and can pause the video now. Um, the next since I think we've covered the kind of, of the key parts of it. Um, and I, I saw someone had a question. So again, this demonstrates uh, kind of the beginning of the cognitive restructuring section where we're helping people to uh, see examples of how the same situation can lead to different thoughts. I mean, same, same situation with different thoughts can lead to different feelings. Um, and we also connect that to behavior. And it's only the beginning of that process and we, go on, uh, you know, elaborating it further with stigma related examples and the like. Uh, so um, somebody had a question. Uh, yeah, you can unmute yourself. Selena, did I thought you did you have a question? 
I was just gonna um agree with what uh they were saying. Okay. Nothing, nothing new. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um basically um you know we're walking people through this process. Uh you know you've done this in other interventions I'm sure, but uh what NEC does is it um it lays it out in a very gradual way where um, maybe some of the things that people might have learned in other forms of therapy can really take hold, right? Um, and uh, hopefully resonate with them. Um, I do wanna note there's some small language differences in the youth version from what you've heard in that clip. There's, it actually, he initially texts a friend, right? He doesn't call a friend. We know that uh, young people don't do that, right? Um, so uh, there's some you know, changes that we made to the language, but it's otherwise very similar. Um, are there any other questions or comments people have about the cognitive restructuring section before we move on to the narrative enhancement section? So there's uh, Uzan. Yeah, I see. You. Hi. Uzan. Yes. Um, um, in in this uh, the mentioned um, um, the clips that we have watched so far um, talked about schizophrenia. And um, how does this apply to other mental health? Uh, for instance, um, eating disorder, because I, I'm more interested in eating disorder. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an open question. Um, and uh, what uh, I would say is probably um, of the version of the manual that I would recommend to you uh, is the transdiagnostic one that um, Lisa Hawk developed that you can find on the nextglobal.org website. Um, and so uh, that might be more broadly uh, applicable to people with conditions such as eating disorders, but it's not specifically connected to that. Um, and I think that there are different negative stereotypes that relate to different mental health conditions such as eating disorders or uh, autism spectrum, you know, uh, many of the different types of things that we encounter. And that might be where there would be a, an adaptation of the manual that would uh, include some of those negative stereotypes in the stigma education section that are more clearly resonant for those conditions. Um, but I do think that the other sections are pretty much not going to change because uh, cognitive restructuring would be taught the same way as would uh, the narrative section, as as we'll see. Maybe we have time and, for one more quick question. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, just really quick, though, I just wanted to mention, you're saying on Net Global, and, and Connor put in uh, yeah. the link to Net Global again, for those yeah. who might have gotten it earlier. Yeah. But materials are actually on there? Yes. Yeah, so um, I put a bunch of stuff up there. I've got the Mandarin, Spanish, our OG manual, um, uh, the... Uh, adaptations that Lisa Hawk did Canada the, for bi youth with bipolar disorder and transdiagnostic. Um, I'm going to get more and more things as as people in the different partners uh, sort of give me permission. But the idea is to have everything there, you know, all 11 languages plus all these adaptations. Great, great, thank yeah. you, thanks. Okay, so um, let's move to the narrative enhancement section, which I'm now going to remember to share my slides. Um, and uh, this will um, give you a sense of um, this last component of NEC that uh, we believe is very important, very helpful. So we have eight pages that are devoted to narrative enhancement. Um, and they're intended to be covered in five weeks. Sorry, that that's a, a, an error there that in the of regular adult version, it's we have seven weeks, but we've shortened it to five. And the idea here is that we're helping people integrate new perspectives on themselves into their life stories or narratives. And we think that cognitive restructuring is only going to go so far in terms of addressing their moment to moment thoughts about themselves, but that when you want to look at deeper uh, beliefs about oneself, you need to get to these stories that people tell about themselves. Um, we do believe that the uh, group component is really important here because um, having an audience for your story uh, is a way of communicating that your story has value. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we think the group aspect is so important in this intervention. 
Um, narrative, there's a lot of research that shows that storytelling is this fundamental mechanism by which people make sense of the world in their lives. So narrative has a, a strong research base. Um, as a therapeutic intervention, it's relatively new, but um, as a cognitive science uh, issue, it's it's pretty, pretty rock solid. Um, and so the idea is that if you need to really integrate something into your idea of yourself, it needs to be integrated into a story to take hold. And one of the reasons why, you know, communities and internalized stigma are so resistant to change is that there's this story of mental illness leading to catastrophic and unrecoverable, unrecoverable loss in life that's so deeply ingrained through all the things that we've been talking about, media, what people say in families, um, you know, other kinds of cultural scripts. Uh, these are just some different books that touch on narrative. Um, Actual Minds, Possible Worlds is a classic uh, by Jerome Br Bruner, a uh, cognitive scientist. Uh, Maps of Narrative Practice is a, a book on narrative-based individual therapy uh, and uh, recommend it um, if you're interested in using narrative in your individual therapy. The Storytelling Animal is a general book geared toward the general public, but that really talks about how storytelling is fundamental to uh, what it is to be a person, human. Um, we have added some video clips of stories again to the youth version. Uh, we don't have time to show them here, but you could see how uh, video clips uh, can be impactful, I hope, when you saw the Drew video clip, which we show earlier. And so we have two uh, clips. Uh, one is uh, Suya Woodard, um, Don't Call Me Crazy, from the um, This Is My Brave uh, archive. Uh, this is a black woman uh, diagnosed with psychosis um, who speaks and, and actually has a written story that she reads uh, if you started at minute four. Um, and so we think that that can be a good way to inspire group members to consider how they could tell a story about themselves. Uh, and then Ruby Bevan is a uh, white female um, who focuses on her experience as a college student. We do want uh, people to tell their first story with that before they see the eclipse. And this is something that Paul Lysacker, when he was around, really made a, a point that he, he felt very strongly about. We don't want people to be copying the stories they hear others tell but to have a chance to tell their own story first and then maybe be inspired by some of the examples that they see. So this is something, again, if you're doing a group, you need to have the audiovisual equipment to do it. Um, if you're doing it in, a, in person to have maybe a laptop or some other kind of computer that you could show it on. Um, this is the core element of the intervention in some ways. And so I guess one question some people might have is like, why is it happening at the end? Well, there's two real reasons. One is that we really thought that group cohesiveness and comfort with the material would really be necessary in order for this section to work best. Um, and so people are very vulnerable and um, show sides of themselves that they don't show at other times in the intervention in this part. Um, and having that cohesiveness we thought was really important. And that really has been borne out in the uh, different um, implementations of NECT over the years. Um, the other thing is that we thought that doing it at the end would really allow this to be an integrative process where they've learned psychoeducation, they've learned cognitive restructuring, and now they can integrate those insights into their narratives. And in the role play clip, you'll see, uh, you'll see that um, I as facilitate or co-facilitator uh, try to do that uh, in one of the stories that's shared. So um, that's another reason we thought this could really be something that's tying everything together. The process of this part is different from the other groups. So I just want to draw attention to that. Uh, there's a lot of silence um, and then there's sharing, right? So after about five minutes of agenda setting, you let people spend roughly 15 to 20 minutes writing a story. Uh, and this is where the co-facilitator or facilitator could help people with literacy issues to kind of dictate their story. We do want it to be written down. We don't want just people to just be telling it off uh, off the cuff. Um, and then we want to give people chances to read their stories and get feedback on them. And so the group facilitators do also provide feedback and they, they, they model that. And then we want to 
I uh, spend five to 10 minutes summarizing themes or different stories. And it's always amazing how many common themes there are. Um, you probably won't have time to read everybody, have everybody read their story if you have a group of, let's say, seven, eight people. Um, so you might start the next group with um, reading some stories if people really wanted to have them read and they didn't have time to. If you have a smaller group of maybe four people, you probably will have time to read everything if everybody's uh, willing to. Um, I want to emphasize the feedback process is really important. And we have this guide to giving feedback. And you'll see in the role play how we allude to that and we draw people's attention to it. Um, and the feedback is what really gives people a chance to revise their story and op opportunities to integrate those ideas from psychoeducation and cognitive restructuring through the questioning. So let's go to the clip, which is um, in the youth version. It's on May and page 53. Um, and you'll see how, uh, I mean, we, we don't spend time letting them uh, tell their stories. Uh, I mean, write their stories. We skip over that. But um, you'll hear one story shared, and you'll see feedback being shared. And uh, Frank Francesca is the main facilitator in this clip. Okay, so where we left off, um, we're on page 19, um, and we were discussing myths about people coping with mental illness, but now we're going to talk about myths about family members coping. I'm with sorry, this is the, the family oh, clip. Uh, you want to show member. number three. Sorry. Oops, sorry. All right, okay. everybody. So we started the process of telling stories about ourselves already, um, and we've discussed um, how to give people feedback on their stories back on page 49, just as a little reminder. Um, but today we're going to do a new story that's really important. Um, so would somebody like to read exercise three for us? Melissa, all right. Thank you. Exercise three, stories on strengths and successes. Tell a story about your life that focuses on your strengths or successes. Strengths relate to things that you found out that you could do that you may not have realized you could do until you were challenged. Successes can relate to dealing with challenges that you have faced, including mental illness, as well as other challenges you may have faced, such as substance abuse, victimization, trauma, homelessness, or health problems. Describe how you managed to overcome a challenge and what you learned about yourself in the process. If appropriate, tell about what hopes and dreams you developed as a result of this experience. Thank you, Melissa. So right. I know there was a lot of information in there. Um, does anybody have a question about, about that? About what kind of stories this could be? I have a question. Um, how could mental illness and substance abuse be successes and strengths? I don't understand. Right. Great, great question. So what we're looking for is for you to write about a situation you've had. And again, it's up to you to decide, but something where you overcame it. Right. And so um, a lot of people um, don't have these challenges and it's easy for them to sort of maybe look judge someone who who does but um people who've overcome them it's often you know shows a lot of inner strength to do it you know or manage you know does that does that answer your question so just again you may have gone through some of these things and not others so it's really pick what applies to you all right so how about we take a couple minutes to write down uh, our stories and then we can get back in a couple minutes okay okay so would anybody be willing to share what they wrote melissa i appreciate your willingness to participate okay so i wrote Back a couple months ago, I would get so extremely overwhelmed with every stress or every problem, I would completely self-isolate and I would feel inadequate. I wouldn't be able to function and would quit my jobs. Ever since starting 
therapy and being hospitalized after an episode I had, I realized that I have it within me to deal with different types of problems and that I can learn new ways of seeing things. I never thought that I had this capability and I'm proud of myself. I think that's a great, great story. And I, I'm glad that you were able to recognize that you're proud of yourself and you see your strengths in what you went through. Um, so great job. Does anybody um, have any feedback or any feelings or any relation to what Melissa just said? Yeah, and you can look at that page 49 uh, guide to getting feedback if you are not sure what kind of things you could ask. Mike, what do you think changed in you that made you go from like thinking that everything was just too much to like now feeling man like it's manageable? You know what what changed? I think be having somebody that was patient with me and teaching me things that I literally didn't know before. Um, I kind of had just one perception about how to manage stress and how to deal with it. I didn't know that I can actually take some time and uh, look at it different ways, kind of like Steve in that example. Um, but I think just having that <clears throat> that um, guidance and that therapy really helped me. And I hear that you're pointing out, Melissa, that you've been using some of the cognitive restructuring skills. Um, you know, and maybe this happened before the group, but, um, you know, it sounds like cognitive restructuring, thinking differently about things might have been one of the things that came into this story. Is that true? Yeah, when I, before I started therapy, I kind of, you know, thought that everything was just not manageable. I wasn't capable. And so uh, slowly, I kind of started to think a little bit differently. And, uh, my psychiatrist was really helping me, just asking me questions. And I, I think that's helping and I'm kind of getting the hang of it. It's really hard, but I'm trying. And I also want to point out that I'm hearing that there were themes of stigma in how you looked at yourself that we've talked about. You know, we were talking about negative stereotypes, right? And that um, idea that a person with a mental illness isn't capable. And it sounds like that was some part of the way you were thinking about yourself that you found a different way to look at. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, I was absolutely certain that I was not capable. It it was it was just day in and day out, just me thinking that I just couldn't do something, uh, feeling overwhelmed, and it felt it felt like a fact that I just couldn't I couldn't do anything. But as I, as I saw, it wasn't a fact. It was just it was what I was feeling that day. It was what I was thinking that day. Are there some other things from that guide to giving feedback that you'd like to ask Melissa about her story? Someone else? I just want to... Oh, yeah, Sherry Arco. I just want to say that I like you feel proud of yourself. That's nice. It's yeah. very nice to give that positive. Yes, Amanda? So I saw there's um, one of the prompts for questions is is there something the narrator is hoping for so I guess I I'm kind of curious for Melissa if there's something that um like are you sort of looking to maintain if you're looking to maintain um these changes that you made in your life how do you plan on I guess keeping up this like momentum with what you've done great question Amanda Thank you, Amanda. I think that I can tr I'm can. i going to try to continue seeing my psychiatrist. There's times where even that feels overwhelming and I don't want to do it, um, but I, I try my hardest to try and continue getting that therapy. But what about something you're hoping for? I'm hoping that I don't go back to how I was because there are days where I feel like I, I can't and I'm starting to get overwhelmed like before and I want to quit my job and it gets really strong. So I'm hoping that that, that doesn't happen. And I think that you spoke to 
before about having a support system and being willing to listen to different perspectives. And if you continue those mechanisms, I think that your hope will be fulfilled. Okay, so you've seen now all the different components of the manual um, demonstrated to these role plays. And just to you know point out, um, when I do a longer training, I engage people in role plays, you do it them yourselves. Uh, we're not doing it here in this uh, for uh, because of the, the larger number of people and the shorter amount of time. And that's why we decided to go with these video uh, role play. But uh, it's certainly uh, more compelling when you're doing it yourself. Um, so uh, what I want to go to now is just give people a chance to ask general questions. Uh, and um, then I know there's some things that Jim will want me to uh, point out Um as well. But so I guess this is an opportunity for some general discussion and questions. Now you've seen all different components of the main. Yeah. And and actually, before we do that, and, uh, and I say this also, um, because sometimes we, we, we really want the feedback on this. Um, as Phil mentioned, this is, I believe, Phil, an all day training that you typically do. And he's doing it here in abbreviated model. We want to make sure that it's meeting your needs. So actually, what I want to do is, is have folks take a quick moment to open up the survey, the post survey. At the beginning of today's webinar, we asked folks to complete a pre-survey. We want everyone to complete the post survey, but especially if you completed the pre-survey, please uh, complete it. Connor will put that in the chat right now. And I just want you to make sure that you, I'm gonna take a quick minute to allow folks to sort of fill that in or at least start filling it in. And then, um, and then we'll move to Q&A. Okay, and I also want to note that people should feel free to reach out to me uh, afterward by email, and uh, this is my email address, so uh, that's, um, you know. Yeah, something that's great, Phil, and, and, and I am curious, Phil, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of your training, um, mm -hmm. I know you said it's an all-day training. We're hoping that this abbreviated model, I know you're hoping that this abbreviated model will give folks enough tools and understanding of the uh, intervention to use mm -hmm. it. Uh, but can folks re reach out to you to get more training or uh, a deeper training on it if, if necessary? Uh, they can definitely reach out. Um, and in terms of doing training, I mean, it really depends on like, is it an agency that is interested in it? You know, uh, like, is it an agency that's interested in implementing it and they want me to come and work with the staff? Yeah, sure. That, that would be great. Um, I don't, you know, I can't really do the training for one person because the co the key part of the intervention is that it's group based sure. so you need a group of people to role play um, but yeah if there's an agency that somebody works with who wants to do this and they think that a more in-depth training in person or by you know just the technology would be useful then I definitely can make that happen I just have to find you know the time in my schedule to do it and uh, you know I'm not looking to make money from this. I, I'm just looking to try to get this out there as much as possible. And uh, that's why we're making all these resources freely available and, and the like. Thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can certainly attest to the fact that Phil's been extremely generous with his time to us, consulting with us on a number of things, providing these trainings. And so, uh, so yeah, please feel free to reach out uh, to Phil on that. Um, so again, I hope uh, maybe folks have had a chance to fi finish a survey. If not, please, be before you close out. But with that said, with that said, uh, please, any questions that are coming up for folks um, that are uh, kind of left, have been, have been left out there, have not been addressed yet, or uh, just in response to that last section, also on the narrative enhancement portion or the narrative portion, excuse me, of the, of the training. Questions? And... Uh, Connor, I believe folks can uh, mute themselves, so I think it's open, so please. Yep. Yeah, or any questions that were from previous uh, parts that we didn't get to talk yeah. in response to. And if if we're not, I, oh, uh, Pat, uh, raise your hand. Pat, it's good to see you. My goodness, wonderful to see you. But Pat, if you have a question for Phil. Oh, it's been way too long. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. It has got to be one of the best trainings I've attended in years. I had no idea about this whole concept of self-stigma, and I am I am so I'm so enthralled by all this. But 
My question you may have mentioned at the beginning and I missed was when this was modified to become a youth um, model. What is the age range that it like starts with? How young would the folks be? Right. Oh, great question. Yeah, I, I didn't specifically talk about that, but our first episode psychosis adaptation is geared toward uh, 15 and older right uh 15 to 24 is kind of this uh what this youth uh, idea is right sort of like that transition from uh childhood to adulthood right um and um the transdiagnostic and bipolar youth versions that um lisa hawk developed uh did not specify age ranges but um i would gen i think that generally this is probably something that would be for you 14 and older um, and probably wouldn't be for younger than 13 or 12. But um, I think that's a, a great question. And also, as we like to say, an empirical question, you know, uh, in terms of language, in terms of examples, you know, our, our examples are based around that people are interested in relationships uh, with others, uh, that they're doing things like texting, that they're um, watching videos, you know, I know people are doing that younger and younger, but is that really going to speak to an 11 year old or a 10 year old? I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't think so necessarily, but, um, it might, but it definitely would speak to probably a 13 or 14 year old. Great. Great. Thank you. Please raise a hand, you know, and, and Pat, Pat is a, an old friend and, um, an amazing clinician with, with many years of experience. And I think for, for Pat to say, and I say this for the entire provider community, you know, yes, this is an issue that I think we need to bring greater attention to, to the interventions that are available, not only the issue of self-stigma, but the interventions that are available to address it. Um, if Pat doesn't know about it, then I, I think it's an issue that we need to bring greater attention to, to everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've, been, I've been trying to get get the word out for the last uh, 18 years, but, um, you know, uh, better late than never. Maybe I'm yeah. just slow on the uptake, but I greatly appreciate it. No. Well, I think that the community, the provider community is also needs to, to sort of get on board. Pat, uh, in a related question, and again, I'm looking to see if there's any hands raised, so I, I might take the facilitator's prerogative and ask a question here. And it's actually related to Pat's question. And I think, uh, so, you know, I think when you think about the, the age and the reasons why, I don't know if the reasons why are this, uh, uh, Phil, around, you know, the age race that you want to start and around the teens, and it's this issue of identity. And I know in the paper that you co-wrote with um, your colleague, Jonathan DeLuca, there's a lot of discussion in there around the issue around identity. I think we saw that in the clip, but meaning uh, intersecting identities. You touched on it a little bit. I wanted to know if you might be able to say a little bit more about that with regards to the many other identities, you know, the illness identity model that you use, but also the multiple intersecting identities around race, gender, uh, sexual orientation and others. And the degree to which that plays a role, I, I think that would be central to working with young people and the reason why you know this becomes so much more right uh, right yeah. and so there are many uh youth who are um you know uh non-binary um engaging with um gender transition and, and affirmation and, and some of those processes or at least exploring that and that's certainly something that can come in uh to play um uh obviously depending where you are uh there may be uh various uh you know, historically marginalized race, racial and ethnic identities represented. Uh, and that's something that can be talked about, especially as they're, we're talking about stigma and we're talking about how uh, stigma operates. People can bring in those experiences, uh, microaggression experiences and the like that relate to those um, identities they have. Um, our experience is that um, people do talk about that, but they also say, yeah, but mental illness is different because here I'm marginalized within my my identity group, right? Uh, and that's been um, the type of dialogue that people have um, in our groups um, around uh, being members of marginalized communities, but then also having that second uh, dairy, secondary marginalization of having a mental health condition. Thanks, Phil. Again, I'm just scanning for questions and I know we're almost short on time, but I want right. to make And when sure do you want me to show your last slides? Let me know, okay? 
Oh, uh, yes. Why don't you, actually, you could put that up just really quick, but I, I, I want to make sure that we also, so really uh, quick, there's some upcoming events that we have optimizing treatment for youth and anxiety uh, related disorders over telehealth um, and understanding and treating the complex comorbidity of ADHD and PTSD. Um, I think for those of you who work with either of those, uh, young people with either of those diagnoses, that would be an important one. Um, I also wanted to quickly mention that um, within a week, for those of you who are looking to um, apply for CEs for this, you'll get, bottom line is you'll get an email within a, a week. Uh, if you've participated in this, been on for at least 75% on your computer, you'll get an email as to how to do that. Um, so I, I really quick, um, you know, it's interesting to me, Phil, and this might be, you know, a question that might, you know, need a lot more time, but you talk a lot about the symptoms of mental illness. And it's, it's so fascinating to me because the signs of mental health stigma in terms of the impact it has, low self-esteem, low self-worth, isolation, uh, many of the other, you know, uh, sort of uh, ways in which uh, self-stigma can impact overlap with symptoms, right? They, they, they're, you know, they're symptoms of depression and, um, and other disorders. So I'm, I'm just curious, and I guess maybe my question is, how, how do you kind of work with this and other providers um, and help people who are in it, adults or youth, distinguish between those two? Because I know you, you, and actually that's a, an important point that you were making earlier, is that's what you help them do is to distinguish between the stigma and mental illness. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that kind of difficult, you know, tightrope to walk. Yeah, it is difficult. I mean, I think in research, you know, it's something that you control for statistically, right? You measure symptoms and uh, you, you know, at baseline and you see if uh, you, there's still an impact, uh, you know, at follow up. Um, but uh, clinically, um, it all depends on what the person's personal story is, you know. And so, um, you know, uh, friends of my, I have friends who've uh, lost uh, siblings, uh, you know, to suicide uh, related to um, the onset of uh, serious mental illness. And they talk about how it wasn't, uh, the suicide was was function of uh, self-stigma. It was about how they looked at themselves as having this extremely marginalized um, identity that they felt was a, a, a death sentence or uh, meant that they wouldn't be able to live the life that they wanted, um, as reflected in those quotes that I read earlier. But um, yes, these things tie together and they overlap. And um, we just want to show some acknowledgement for the fact that um, social stigma impacts people. Um, and it's not all just uh, neurochemicals and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I have actually seen a paper brief that, that basically said that sometimes, right, the impact of stigma can be um, as bad or worse than the illness itself. Right. And that's how a lot of people will talk about it. And right. so we want to give voice to that. We want to give them a chance to, not everyone's going to want to do this, but um, if you offer it where you're working, you're giving people who are ready for that an opportunity. Oh, great. And so uh, I, I want to thank you, Phil, really quick for folks. Again, as we've already mentioned, the materials, the recording, the slides, and all of the manuals are going to be uploaded to our um, site uh, within a couple of days. So you can go back. The reason why we did this and recorded it as well is for those of you who want to share the site, the materials, the recordings to others who weren't here today, they can then view it and hopefully get enough information uh, to be able to implement this and or reach out to Phil. Um, you know, so uh, we really want to uh, thank you all for being a part of this uh, training today. We want to thank Phil uh, for presenting today. I want uh, us all pleased to sort of please, uh, thank Phil for his uh, for his work and his dedication to this project uh, or to this work. Um, and and once again, I want to thank you all for being here today. And we hope that we'll see you to, uh, again in future offerings. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Jim. It's been an honor. Thank you, Phil. Thanks.